Well, hello everyone. I hope you all are well as we finish up uh, week number three of remote learning here. And there is a reason that we have lemons in the background of this slide. So just stay tuned and you'll see. Uh, like Monday's video, this one's going to be relatively short because it is a relatively short chapter. So let's get started. All right. So coming up, the chapter 10 quiz, Friday at midnight, Friday at midnight. And then the big one tonight at midnight is the business plan marketing strategy. So hopefully you're just about uh, set with that. And as usual, I'll uh, be sending comments to your entire team via email in the next couple of days. And so with that, let's kick things off today. So just a little reminder that our uh, chapter is on product design and development. Product design and development. So I thought we'd start today with a look at product utility. Product utility. So let's define what utility is. If something has utility, it means it's useful, beneficial, it provides value. And so utility marketing, marketing is being able to design and deliver products that provide that. And there's four types of product utility that your product should have. The first, time utility, okay? Having your product available at a convenient time for your customers. Think of bathing suits. When do you want bathing suits available? In the summer, right? Time utility, have bathing suits available in the summer. Back to school supplies, have them available in August before everybody goes back to school. Being open 24 hours, right? 7-Eleven, perfect for time utility. Amazon, always open. You can shop anytime. And that's time utility. Place utility, similarly, having your stuff available in a convenient location for your customers. Could be in a retail store, in a mall. If you're a food truck, being where the people are, right? If you're in D.C., Farragut Square is probably a pretty good place to have your food truck. Convenient location. And then 7-Eleven and Amazon, again, great examples. 7-Eleven, typically in densely populated areas, convenient for people. And Amazon shopping from home. You can't get much more convenient than that. You can make an argument that 7-Eleven's entire business model is based on Time and place utility. Time and place utility. Let's take a look at their website. And when you take a look at the about portion of it, the first thing that comes up is give the customers what they want, when and where they want it. Time and place utility. Right? That's the one quote they have, and that's what it speaks to. When and where they want it. Time and place utility. Do you all know where the name 7-Eleven came from? Well, if you don't, I'm going to show you. Because the 7-Eleven story in years, they started in 1927. In 1946, they changed their name to 7-Eleven to reflect the new hours. They were the, one of the first stores to open 7 8 11 p seven days a week to be open that many hours. Back then, it was pretty unheard of to be open that long. But they wanted to bring convenience to everybody. So that's where the name's from. They were open from 7A to 11P back in the 40s. And this goes right up to the present day. And you'll see it right to the present. They give the customers what they want, when and where they want it. And they now have 60,000 stores. So again, time and place utility is a key for 7-Eleven. Two other types of utility that um, you need to have for your products. One is form utility, and that's just changing the product's composition from whatever raw materials went into the product to into the finished design, something that your customers want. So it's the finished design, it's updating for new models, updating for new features, putting your product in a form that your customers want. And then finally, ownership utility could come from having multiple uses for your product. So it has more use, it has more benefits. Think of something like honey. You can put honey on pancakes. You can use it as a spread. 
Some people use it as a sweetener. Some people use it as kind of a cough syrup. Multiple uses. Multiple ownership utility. And then also easing the transfer from the seller to the buyer, making it easy to transfer ownership. What's an example of that? Well, when you sell cars, offering financing, making it easier for the buyer to buy it. If you're a store, offering shipping and delivery, making it easier for the buyer to get it. A real estate agent, their whole business model is based on that because it's a complex process of getting a house from the seller to the buyer, all sorts of forms, and that's their job of a real estate agent to make that process easy. So four types of product utility to think about. Okay, so to help you design your product, one thing you can do is take a look at what everybody else is doing. Okay, so look at other competitors in your industry. And the logos on the bottom there are just some of the main competitors in the athletic apparel industry. Okay, you're going to have competition in your business, and for your business plans, you need to be able to assess your competition. So I'd ask you, do you think that's one of the more important parts of your business plan, or not so much, being able to assess the competition? Well, I think it's one of the most important things you're going to do in your business plan, for a couple reasons. One, customers have a choice, right? You have to be able to differentiate your product from your, from your competitors. In order to do that, you got to know what your competitors are offering, what their products are like. Secondly, your competitors can act as a benchmark for you, as a good basis for comparison. How are they doing? Let's say Nike is up 5% this year. Well, is that good or bad? Well, the answer is it depends. If Adidas and Under Armour are up 20%, it's probably not so good. But if Adidas and Under Armour are losing money, it's probably pretty darn good. So, it's a good benchmark to know what your competitors are doing. Then finally, I'd say, you can get a lot of good ideas from your competitors, right? What new products are they offering? What new features do they have? What new technologies are they using? What markets are they going into? Why are they doing that? Why are they succeeding? Why are they failing? What can we learn from them? So all sorts of good reasons to really be on top of your competition and be able to assess your competition. Now, can you just steal something from your competitors? Well, there's things like patents and trademarks and copyrights that you can't do. And we're actually going to talk about those three things at the end of today's lecture. So while you can't do that, you can certainly take a look at what your com competitors are doing and say, okay, what can we learn from them? What can we adapt from them? Okay, because there's no monopolies in the U.S. that aren't regulated. The U.S. wants competition. They want better products, better features, better services at a lower price. And the way to do that is for competitors to know what each other is doing. So evaluate your industry. Okay, forecasting demand. So, it's one of the hardest things to do in business for new or existing businesses. And you have to do this in your business plans. You need to project your sales for one year, and then you also have to make financial projections for three years. So, how are you going to do it? Well, if you're an existing business, you can look at historical trends. What did we do last year or the year before and project forward? You don't have the ability to do that. So you can see how other businesses are doing and figure, all right, we'll have this percentage of the market. If they're doing this much, we could be here. You could talk to potential customers, surveys, online polls, right? How much do you buy? How often do you buy it? Why do you buy it? Where do you buy it? Would you try mine? Ask potential customers. You could also talk to people in similar businesses. It's actually required for your business plans that you do that because you can get a ton of good information for people that have already been through the process. And then finally, there's all sorts of data out there. The Census Bureau has the data on demographics and other things. 
associations have good market data your competitors might have something on their websites just in general on the internet you can find all sorts of good information that'll help you with forecasting demand well wag and swag hmm what do you think those terms are there are terms you might hear in business we talked the other day about abc always be closing something you might hear well you might hear wag and swag and you're not going to find this in the book and i'll tell you why because a wag a wag is a wild ass guess yep a wild ass guess you might hear that term and here's something called the strategic cfo that talks about it and actually they talk about a swag is better than a wag. A swag is a scientific wild ass guess. And it's kind of a humorous way to make a valid point. And that is when you're making projections, don't just pull something out of the air. You have to have some thought behind it. And that's something you need to do with your businesses. You can't walk into a bank and say, we think we're going to make $100,000 next year. And the bank says, well, where'd you get that? And you say, yeah, I don't know. It sounds good to me. They're not going to want to hear that. All right? There has to be some thought behind it, some science behind it. We talked about a food truck earlier. All right, so let's say you're a food truck. Okay? You can say, hmm, in this area where a food truck is, how many workers are there? You can find that out. How many other trucks are there? We can find that out. What's the average sales for a food truck in this area? We can find that out. Okay, so based on all that, we think our market share can be X, so we think our demand is going to be this. Okay, maybe right, maybe wrong, but if you're thinking through it, you're coming up with a reasonable explanation of what your demand is, and that's what people want to hear. A scientific wild-ass guess in a humorous fashion. You have to have something behind it. You can't just pull it out of the air. Okay, so in terms of forecasting demand, while it's important for all industries, it's particularly important in some, and let's talk about those. Airlines. Why is it particularly important for them? Well, you can't resell an empty seat, right? Once that plane takes off, that's it. That plane is gone and you cannot sell that seat after that. Southwest Airlines, before all this coronavirus stopped air travel, they would have, say, 10 flights a day from BWI to Boston. Why didn't they have eight? Why weren't there six? Why weren't there 12? Why weren't there 20? How big was the plane going there? All of that all those answers was based on them being able to forecast demand. They knew that 10 was the right amount of flights. The plane should be this big. When was the last plane trip you took? Was the flight pretty full? I bet it was, because airlines have to be good at forecasting demand. Hotels, similarly. You can't resell a hotel room. Once the night has passed, the chance to resell that hotel room for that evening is gone okay if you're Marriott and you found a good site for a hotel well what are you gonna build there Marriott has 30 brands are you gonna put up a Ritz a W a Marriott a Sheridan a Weston a Renaissance a courtyard they own all those brands someone has to decide which of those goes up in that space how big's the hotel 50 rooms 100 rooms 400 rooms how much conference center space does it have? A lot? A little? None? How big is the gym? How big is the restaurant? All those questions, they need to be able to forecast demand in order to answer them. Movies. Why do they have to be able to forecast it? Well, largely, it determines their budget, right? Where they can shoot, what stars they can afford. They have to know, here's how much we think this movie is going to return now we can build our budget based on what it's going to return. When you, can, when you ask a movie, did this, was this a successful movie or a bomb? Let's say a movie returned $20 million. Which was it? It depends on what the budget was. 
if it was a $5 million budget, successful movie. If it had a $100 million budget, then it's a bomb, right? So very important for movies to be able to forecast what the demand is. And then finally, restaurants. Again, you can't resell an empty seat. Some products you can. Think of sneakers. If you don't sell sneakers one day, they're still on the shelf the next day and the next day. You can buy them from Amazon the next day or the next day. That's not the case with all businesses. And if you're going to build a restaurant, how big is the restaurant? How many seats? How big is the bar area versus the table area? Do you have an outdoor area? If so, how big? All those questions, the answers are based on the ability to forecast demand. So for many industries, being good at that, being able to do it, it can be the difference between being profitable and being bankrupt. So important, and you'll have to do it for your businesses. All right, break-even analysis. We're getting close to the time when you see a couple of videos, so let's talk about break-even analysis. Okay, for your businesses, let's say you've been in business for three months. And in those three months, you've closed a grand total of one sale. One sale. Do you think you made or lost money? Well, chances are you lost money if you only made one sale in three months, right? Okay, now let's say you made 5,000 sales. Do you think you made or lost money? Well, if you made 5,000 sales in three months, I bet you made a lot of money. You're pretty darn happy as a startup. Well, somewhere in between one sale and 5,000 sales is the break-even point. The amount of sales you'd make to just break even. And any sales under that, you lost money. And any sales over that, you made money. And for businesses, it's important to be able to estimate where that point is. And those formulas there help you to determine where that point is. So I wanted to talk through that. And if you'll notice, both of the formulas talk about fixed and variable costs. Fixed and variable costs. So let's define what those are. And it's best to use an example to help define them. And I'm going to use the example of a Subway restaurant. You all know what a Subway restaurant is. So fixed costs are those that don't change with the number of sales you make. Okay, if you sell a sub, if you sell 100 subs one day and 150 the next day, the fixed costs don't change. Variable costs, on the other hand, do change with the number of subs you sell. So let's start with fixed cost. What's a fixed cost for Subway? Costs that don't change no matter how many subs you sell. Well, things like your rent, your insurance, utilities, marketing and advertising costs, salaries for the people that you have to have there just to be open. Whatever your loan amount is, if you took out a loan to buy the store and to buy the tables and chairs, you're paying back the same amount potentially every month. Those are all fixed costs of a Subway restaurant. They're not going to change no matter how many subs you sell, which means the variable costs do change with the number of subs you sell. Things like the meat, turkey, roast beef, cold cuts, lettuce, onions, tomatoes, the Coke, the Sprite, the Dr. Pepper, all those things, they change. Variable costs, cups, plates, napkins, straws, those are all variable costs of Subway. So, in order to do a break-even analysis, we've now determined what are fixed costs and what are variable costs. So let's do a break-even analysis. And I think the easiest way to demonstrate this is to think of the most basic business you can. What's the most basic possible business you can think of? Well, when I think of what the most basic business is, here's what I come up with. A lemonade stand. Can't get much more basic than that, right? So, let's run the analysis on that. Fixed cost. In this example, they're $20. The cost for the stand, the chair to sit in, and the pitcher. 
That's it. That's your fixed cost. What's the variable cost? Well, for a paper cup, that lemonade mix, and the water, 10 cents. So every time you sell one unit, you're going to be spending 10 cents on the cup, the lemonade mix, and the water. And in our example here, let's say the price, we're going to charge $1.10 for every cup of lemonade. Well, that means that our contribution to fixed cost per unit is a dollar. Here's what I mean by that. If your price is $1.10, 10 cents $10 of that goes to your variable cost, right? You're going to cover the cost of the cup, the lemonade mix, and the water, 10 cents. That leaves a dollar that goes to cover your fixed cost of 20 bucks. That's your contribution to fixed cost per unit. 10 cents goes to variable cost, a dollar goes to cover fixed cost. Okay, so now that we have that, let's go back in and calculate it. And our break in, our break even units, okay, it's total fixed cost over contribution to fixed cost per minute. So, $20 fixed cost, $1 contribution to fixed cost per minute. So, if we sell 20 units, we'll break even. Let's see if that works. Okay, price is $1.10. 20 units times $1.10 means we made 22 bucks. Okay. $22. Did we cover our fixed cost of $20? Yep. And we sold 20 units at $0.10 cents each. Another $2. There's your break-even point. So if we sell 20 units at $22, will give us $22, we'll cover all of our fixed costs and our variable costs. That's our break-even analysis for this lemonade stand. So if we sell 21 or more units, we made money. If we sold 19 or fewer units, we lost money. That's how we did our break-even analysis. Obviously, for bigger companies, it's a lot more complex. Let's take an example of Nike. In 2016, Nike stopped selling golf equipment. They had to be able to determine that golf equipment they were losing money on. It was a loser for them. Why are we doing this? You know how many things Nike sells, right? But they were able to determine that golf equipment wasn't profitable. They had some level of break-even analysis to determine that. In my business, we had something called a desk cost. I knew that for every broker we hired, they had to produce a certain amount of business because I knew what my costs were. I knew what my rent was per desk, how much the utilities, the insurance, the IT costs, the benefits for that individual. I knew I needed to cover a certain amount to make that person profitable. And if they didn't bring in sales over that amount, I was losing money by having them there. I needed to know that. Otherwise, how many people do you hire? You don't know. Is it better to have a thousand people because you're making money or not? You need to have some idea what it is. And so no matter what your business is, it's good to be able to determine that. It also illustrates the importance of fixed costs, why you really have to keep those down. Let's look at it the other way. Let's say you built the most beautiful lemonade stand around. You built a mahogany lemonade stand. You had a marble top to it. You used a crystal pitcher. Now your fixed costs are $5,000 instead of $20. Now how many cups do you have to sell? A heck of a lot, right? So you got to keep those fixed costs down because the more those fixed costs go up, the more units you have to sell. So when thinking, where am I going to put my office? Do you want to go to a beautiful, gleaming downtown office building in D.C.? No problem. But guess what? You better sell a lot more units because it costs a lot more to be in those buildings. So you want to keep those fixed costs down. All right. I teased you by saying we got a couple videos. We've got them. And there's a reason I'm showing these. The first I'm going to show you is an ad you probably saw a couple of years ago that featured a lemonade stand. And I'll bring up the ad in a second. And there's a reason I'm showing you the ad. And that is because right after the main character in this made this, he made a second 
follow-up video that's only about two minutes long that I'm sure you haven't seen. So with that, let's start by showing you the ad. Is that iced tea? Nope. Lemonade. So iced tea? Lemonade. Iced tea? With these people, man. Lemonade. Read sign. Lemonade. Read it. Okay. Delicious. Iced tea at a lemonade stand? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much money Marin saved by switching to Geico. Mm -hmm. It's lemonade, man. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. All right, cute commercial, right? You've probably all seen it. Well, take a look at this house area here, what Ice-T is wearing. Because right after they made this commercial, Ice-T did a little two-minute video on his thoughts about sales and negotiation. That's actually, I think, very clever. And he actually references ABC, the ABCs we talked about. So let me show you that video next. And it's not there. Here we go. It said when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Then what do you do? Drink it? Please. I say you take that lemonade and you sell it to a thirsty fool at top dollar. Okay? Now pay attention and I'm going to show you how to negotiate like a G or like me, iced tea. This is priceless. Always keep eye contact or wear sunglasses. This forces the customer to stare at themselves and who's not going to buy lemonade from themselves. It also helps you look cool, unless you're me, in which case I always look cool. Now you can earn a customer's respect or you can do this. Pour the customer some lemonade. Then you take a sip. Oh my God, that's good. That tastes like respect and money. Then offer said lemonade. Now if they want to haggle, never haggle with them. Just stare. Now, if they continue to haggle, use words like bespoke and artisanal. I don't know what those words mean, but they sound expensive. Remember your ABCs. Always be confusing. Example, if you buy another lemonade, I'll give you the third free for double the price. What? Exactly. There is no step five. It should be just you counting dollar bills. If not, you weren't paying attention. In that case, may I interest you in some artisanal bespoke lemonade? Miss Teeth, it's lemonade. That's nice tea. With these people, man. So, pretty clever, right? Business advice from iced tea. What more can you ask for? And now you know why there were lemons in that uh, picture earlier. All right, let's move forward to the consumer buying process. So studies show that consumers typically go through these five steps when buying something. You're all consumers. So take a minute and just look through each of those five steps. Now the time frame depends upon the product. If you're looking to buy a house, it could be years for you to go through this process. A car could be months. A laptop, days or weeks. If you're just going to buy lunch, this could be minutes or even seconds. Think about it. Need recognition. I'm hungry. I don't feel like going out. Information search. Eh, let's take a look at some online menus for chopped and panera and chipotle evaluation i feel like chipotle purchase go to your uber eats app click and there you go and then post purchase evaluation ah it was delicious i'd certainly consider chipotle again boom you just went through 
the consumer buying process. Now, businesses know all about this. And given their knowledge of this process, how do you think they might use this information to design strategies that would maximize sales? Okay, this chapter is about design and development. How would they use this information to design strategies to maximize sales? What would be an example? Well, one example is in store design. Store design. Some studies say that about two-thirds of what you buy, you had no intention of buying. So take a look at this grocery store layout. Now, think of your grocery store. It might not be exactly like this, but it's probably pretty familiar. Why? It's not a coincidence that grocery stores are typically laid out this way. You might have flowers at the entrance or a Starbucks right at the entrance right? Entices you to come in, smells good, fresh, natural, cup of coffee, puts you in a good mood, right? The bakery and the produce right in the front, fresh, again, the smell, something you can touch, might get you hungry. All these things would get you to spend more, get you in a good mood. Where are essentials typically in a grocery store? Cheese, eggs, butter, milk, OJ typically in the back. Why is that? Because the stores want to bring you through for the people that are just going to pick those things up to walk through the rest of the store, ideally to buy other things. Buy other things. End caps, right? People typically associate products on the end caps with value. So you have to pay more to have your products there. Stores know that and they'll charge more for end caps. How about within the aisle itself? Where's the best level? Is it best to be on the top, the bottom, or kind of toward the middle? Well, in retail, generally speaking, eye level is buy level. Eye level is buy level. That's where you want your products because people can easily see them. Typically, bulk or store brands are closer to the bottom because people that want those things, they'll hunt for them. And they'll find them. Kid-friendly stuff. Put that on the lower levels, too, so the kids can see them. Impulse items, where are they? By the register, right? Candy, lip aid, breath mints, magazines. No accident that those are there. Who shops at a CVS? I bet most of you. Where's the pharmacy in your CVS? Where are the cards in your CVS? Chances are they're toward the back of the store. Again, no coincidence, because so many people go to CVS just to pick up those things, a card or whatever drugs they need. CVS wants to bring you all the way through the store, so maybe you'll buy other things. Target. Target is known for being very strategic as to how they set up their stores. And I've got a short video here, about four minutes, that talks about how they do it, that I think is very interesting. Have you ever been to Target expecting to buy one or two things and then walked out hours later with much more than you planned? You're like, oh, I didn't know I needed this. And then you just pick it off the shelf, put it in your cart. I just spend so long there, it's like me into a black hole. Yeah, same. It's a pretty common experience and it's become known on the internet as the Target Effect. But it's more than just a popular meme. It turns out Target has a few ways of making sure you'll want to take everything off the shelves. You've probably noticed that it's pretty hard to walk into Target, grab one thing, and leave. The real genius behind that is in the store's layout. When you walk in, you'll likely see a Starbucks near the entrance. The coffee shop helps establish a welcoming vibe, inviting people to come in and hang out. Once you walk past Starbucks, the store flows naturally from one section to the next, so you end up browsing through pretty much every aisle. Right by the makeup, you'll find hair products. Next to hair products are the toiletries, next to those are cleaning supplies, and so on. Say you're planning on stopping by just to pick up something from the seasonal section, like school supplies in August or Halloween costumes in October. 
for those, you'll have to head to the back of the store. So you have to follow the store around and then, um, you know, before you know it, you've ended up filling out your entire cart with other stuff that you didn't plan to get. Visually, Target stands out from other big box retailers like Walmart, which can sometimes be disorganized in comparison. So Target's known for having good, clear signage. That's the kind of key way, you know, shoppers know where they're going, they don't want to get frustrated in the store, they can go straight there. The stores are brightly lit and colorful, the aisles are wide, and the merchandise is spread out and well organized. That's why Target is so enjoyable to shop at, which is why people end up spending more time there than they planned. And studies have shown that the more time customers spend in a store, the more likely they are to spend money. Customers also love Target's exclusive private labels which offer the latest trends for affordable prices. For example, its kids apparel line Happy Jack surpassed 2 billion in sales just one year after its launch. And these are often low cost, um, so kind of people might buy a lot more than if they're going to another store, which is national brands. Partnerships with celebrities like Victoria Beckham and Chrissy Teigen also help drive traffic to the stores. But Target makes sure to constantly rotate its merchandise. One of the most effective ways to make people spend money is to make them feel like this product is only going to be available now. Like if you come back next week, it's not going to be there. So buy it now. This feeds into a sort of treasure hunt shopping experience, typical of stores like TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And if you're having trouble finding something, Target employees are easily spotted thanks to their red shirts. If there's someone there to advise you, you're more likely to buy things because you can get a bit of an expert opinion, you're not just shopping on your own. Then there's Target's social media game which is especially strong on Instagram. It has 3.1 million followers. That's more than Walmart and Amazon combined. Target encourages shoppers to share photos of what they buy for a chance to be featured on its account. So people are always posting about their purchases. Kind of brings the shopper in to the experience. And there are loads of Target um, kind of fan pages dedicated to the store. Finally, near the cash registers, there's a Target Calls Bullseye's Playground where you'll find seasonal items for only a few dollars. I would bring the dollar bins that are in the front. Like, oh, I always have a dollar to spend on something. I could always get something there. And it's like something stupid, like a pencil holder. But NYU professor Priya Raghavir says the real key to target success is that you don't actually regret buying anything. Those unplanned purchases, they're often things people do want. They just hadn't thought of putting them on their shopping list. So what's something you recently bought at Target that you weren't planning on getting? <clears throat> so interesting, isn't it? No accidents or coincidences in store design. It's actually a very um, strategic, very thoughtful process. And it's based on a knowledge of how consumers behave, the consumer buying process. And with that, <clears throat> we are going to turn to the last slide of the chapter, last slide of the day. Told you this was a relatively um, short chapter. And it's protecting your idea, so we referenced it earlier. Once you've come up with your idea, you want to make sure that people aren't stealing the basics from it. And so there's three main avenues you can go, getting a patent or a trademark or a copyright and they're all a little bit different so a patent okay ideas and inventions that's what patents cover okay if you've got a good idea or an invention you'd apply for a patent they're good for 20 years 20 years now how long do you think it takes the patent and trademark office because that's who you go to there's a United States Patent and Trademark Office. That's where you'll register it. How long do you think it takes them to approve a patent? Well, if you said about 22 months, you'd be right. It takes that long, generally speaking, about 22 months from the time you submit your patent to the time it's approved. Why so long, I think you're asking. Well, in fiscal year 2019, how many patents do you think were issued by the Patent and Trademark Office? Just come up with a number in your head. Fiscal year 2019, how many patents did the PTO issue? The answer, 
370,434. That's a lot of patents, right? So when you think back to that uh, quote we talked about at the beginning of this chapter, everything that can be invented has been invented. Well, over 370,000 patents just last year. That's a lot. Trademark. Okay, if patents are for ideas and inventions, trademarks protect words, phrases, symbols, designs. Okay, you might have seen this little R on those things. That's a trademark. There's actually another um, trademark symbol that you guys could use. You might have seen a little TM in some places that says trademark. Well, you know what? That little TM, and it's relatively rare, that has no legal standing at all. You could put the TM on whatever logo you guys come up with. Generally speaking, it just is informing people that it's your logo, it's your use. It may be signaling that, you know what, we've applied for a patent and we haven't gotten it yet. You're just serving notice. But ultimately, it has no legal standing, that little TM. But if you do get a trademark, then you can put the little R. That means you've got the trademark. And so it's actually a very easy process to do, to get either a patent or trademark. So this is the Patent and Trademark Office, and these are trademarks. Here's the basic information about it. Here you can search for trademarks that are out there. That's how you apply. You just click on it. It's, you know, it's a relatively straightforward process. Patents, okay, it's the Patent and Trademark Office, basically the same thing. Okay, patent basics. Apply for a patent, application assistance. So you just go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website and you go through it. Now, once you become, if you are a big business or become a big business, then you probably want to get a patent lawyer to help you with this. Um, because there's, with anything else, there can be complications. But it's still a relatively straightforward process. So the Patent and Trademark Office issues patents and trademarks. And that brings us to our last one, which is copyrights. And that protects original works of authorship. So think of things like books and music and movies. Okay, that's where you get a copyright. And you've probably seen that little C. And if patents are good for 20 years, trademarks are good for 10 years. Okay, trademarks 10 years, although you're allowed to essentially renew them indefinitely. How long do you think copyrights are good for? Well, you'd probably never guess it. Most copyrights are good for the life of the author plus 70 years. The life of the author plus 70 years for books, movies, and, um, and music. And um, you go to a separate uh, website for this. It's the U.S. Copyright Office. They're actually part of the Library of Congress, but again, it's similar. Register for a copyright, search copyright records, you know, blah, 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 blah. Relatively straightforward uh, process. So those are three different ways that you can protect your idea with a patent, a trademark, or a copyright. And with that, that's it for the day. You said it's a relatively short chapter, so you have your quiz for this chapter 10 on Friday night. Okay, don't forget the marketing section of your business plan is due at midnight um, tonight, tonight. And the next video you get will be on uh, Monday. So with that, stay safe, everyone, and uh, take care. And we'll be in touch again on Monday.